Thank you, Senator Langford. Uh, Senator Hawley. Thank you, Madam Chair. Congratulations to the nominees. Thanks for being here. Ms. Calderon, if I could just come to you and, and pick up where Senator Langford left off a moment ago. In the case that he was referencing involving the District of Columbia and the prohibition mm -hmm. on churches meeting in person, either indoors or outdoors, the United States District Court for the District of Columbia was sharply critical of the district, reversed the district's ban in a written opinion. Did they get it right? You're talking about a decision of the district, of right. the D.C. Court of Appeals, not the D.C. Circuit. Uh, I'm talking about the, the district court for the district of, of D.C. But the federal district. Correct. Court. That's okay. correct. Sorry. That's correct. Yeah. Uh, I have not read that opinion, Senator. Um, but again, my concern with answering the questions, um, hypotheticals, is that if, if restrictions were to be reimposed and challenges were to come to me as a sitting judge on the D.C. Court of Appeals, I would want to... Uh, assure the parties that come before me that I'm an impartial adjudicator. To, to give me some sense then of how you'd perform the analysis, I mean, how would you walk through if the same restrictions were reimposed as existed in DC until the district court struck them down, how would you walk through the analysis? Well, again, I believe the Supreme Court's uh, recent decisions last year in, in what they call the shadow docket uh, um, have changed the analysis a little bit from what it was before. And so I would want to study that very carefully to make sure I'm applying those standards correctly to the facts that are before me. Give me your sense of what those standards are now as you understand them. Uh, well, I, before, I believe there was more of a requirement that you had to have evidence um, uh, that, the law, that the law had to not be neutral on its face. And now uh, I think the court has analyzed some laws that appear neutral on their face, but maybe have a, uh, a burden that on certain houses of worship. But I'm not as familiar with the decisions. I have not had an opportunity to address those issues in my practice. With respect to religious liberty, um, as you may know, the Civil Rights Division actually enforces a number of statutes that prohibit religious discrimination and promote religious liberty. So I do have experience under fed federal statutory law enforcing the Religious Land Use and Institutionalized Persons Act, uh, as well as the religious accommodation provisions of Title VII. And so um, that's, that's been sort of my universe of experience on religious liberty issues, and I, and I do appreciate the importance of it. Are, are you familiar with the Lakumi case from the United States Supreme Court? Uh, this was a, yes, sort of. This, I believe it involved uh, the free exercise of uh, Santa Ria religion in, right. in Miami, but I don't remember uh, enough about it to discuss well, it. Here, here's why I ask. The, the, the holding of the Lukumi case is yeah. that even laws that appear to be and are formally neutral and generally applicable, nevertheless, if they uniquely burden Correct. a religious group, uh, particularly a, a religious association, Yes. whether that's a church or in this case not, not, a, not, a, not a Christian or Jewish congregation but an entirely different religion, if they uniquely burden or dis, disproportionately burden uh, that religious entity, then they are unconstitutional. Now, that's been the law for quite some time. Lukumi is an old case now, so that's not a tr I, I don't think you attribute that to the Supreme Court's docket. What alarms me about your answer a second ago is you said you, you think that the Supreme Court's moved the goalposts in its shadow docket. The rule you just described to me is the rule of Lukumi, isn't it? Well, I'm not as familiar with that. I'm, I'm more familiar with the federal statutory standards under RELUPA, which do um, prohibit an unjustified uh, substantial burden on religion. That, that's, that's what I know. Right. Well, that, and that's certainly true. And, and for my money, that ought to be the constitutional rule as well. But uh, listen, I'll give you some of these questions for the record to let you to familiarize yourself, particularly with the district court's opinion uh, in, the, uh, in, in the D.C. case, which I think is a really important one. Let me just ask you about some of your political involvement, Ms. Calderon. You are one of the more partisan, have one of the more partisan political records that I've seen for a D.C. circuit nominee, D.C. court nominee, I'm sorry. Uh, you're the acting deputy assistant attorney general in the Biden administration. You've worked previously for Senator Schumer. You've donated to Hillary Clinton's campaign, to now President Biden's campaign. You've also donated to some sitting Democrat senators uh, in the Senate, of course, which is entirely your, your, your right to do. But here's my question. Do you think that parties who come before you can expect and anticipate and have confidence that you will be a politically neutral arbiter? Thank you for asking me that. And I certainly hope so based on my record of serving more than 20 years in the Department of Justice under both Republican and Democratic administrations. I joined the department through the Attorney General's Honors Program in 2001 during the Bush administration. 
I have now served more years under Republican administrations than I have Democratic administrations, and I am proud of all the work that the Civil Rights Division has done under both. But let me ask you this, uh, speaking of the, of the Civil Division, the Civil Rights Division, uh, it, it handles many election law disputes, including the department's recent lawsuit against the state of Georgia for their election laws. Uh, were you involved in that case? No, I was not. Senator. Did you advise in a policy capacity in any way? No, Senator. In my current role as an acting deputy assistant attorney general, I am responsible for reviewing the work of two sections that uh, enforce statutes that prohibit employment discrimination. I've also been responsible for implementing the Service Members and Veterans Initiative Act of 2020, which was signed into law by President Trump earlier this, earlier this year. Let me ask you about the Brnovich case, Brnovich versus the DNC. Were you involved in that case? I was not. Uh, what do you understand the holding of that case to be as it would bind you? Senator, voting rights has not been an area that I have focused on. Have you read the Brnovich case? I, I did skim it when it came out, correct. So what do, what do you, what's your memory and understanding of what you would be compelled to follow according to Supreme Court precedent? Well, again, that voting rights is not in my current portfolio. Are you telling me you're not prepared to, to, to adjudicate voting rights disputes? I'm, I'm not sure what, what to make of this answer. Are, are, are you not prepared to adjudicate these? You're just saying that you didn't prepare for today. No, I'm saying that voting, voting rights is not in my current portfolio. It is not something I have focused on the last few years. And so you're not prepared to answer my questions about it? No, I'm happy to answer your question for the record. Uh, I'm, I'm noticing a pattern here. I mean, you're not answering my questions on voting rights. You're not answering them on religious liberty. You're asking for a very important judgeship, uh, but you're telling me you're not familiar with large swaths of the law. And I understand that you're under oath here in front of cameras. I'm sure you were advised not to answer questions. But can I just tell you that it's very hard for me to evaluate your record on these issues, your positions, if you're telling me that you're not familiar with large portions of, of very important law, including Supreme Court cases, including Supreme Court precedents that are quite old, frankly, and venerable, that you apparently have no memory of, and in the case of Brnovich, Supreme Court cases that are quite recent and important that you say that you're not familiar with. That's a, that's a big concern for me. Well, Senator, I am aware of those decisions. I just... Good. Well, tell me what you think they mean, then, and how you're going to apply them. I'm aware of the decisions. I understand Brnovich involved Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act. Good. I know that it involved an Arizona law. I don't know enough about it to speak with you about it at this, at this time. My approach as a generalist in the appellate section has been to get up to speed on the area of law for the cases that are before me at the time that they are before me. <laughs> Well, listen, I'll give you these questions for the record. I just have to tell you, I'd be less con I sit on the Judiciary Committee. I'd be less concerned about this if this weren't a consistent pattern. I th you are very, clearly a very accomplished attorney. I mean, there's no doubt about that, and extremely capable. I mean, there's no doubt about that. So I, I just don't believe that it's not a, ma that a matter of you not being familiar with case law. My guess is you have an incredible mastery of huge bodies of case law. I suspect your advice not to be prepared on these issues so that you could just say that you don't know and you can't answer the questions. I just submit to you I think that that's unacceptable. So I'll give you these answers, these questions for the record, but I have to tell you, uh, based on what you've not told me here today, I'm really, really concerned. Thank you, Madam Chair.